Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about something a little different um, than what you might typically see um, in agricultural education, extension, and communication. Visual theory and visual studies have been done in AgCom. There are a few faculty around the country that um, have done several studies. Um, Tracy Rutherford down at Texas A&M, um, myself and Leslie Edgar at the University of Arkansas have sort of done some stuff. Um, Annie Speck, who will soon be at Ohio State, she's done a few things with visual um, research as well based on some of the stuff that she did with her master's degree with me. So I want to touch on visual foundations and visual theory because it's sort of an interesting look at communication theory. Um, something a little different that you might not have thought about in a different way. And basically a lot of visual communications, visual literacy theory, um, deals with how we make meaning of the world. And if you think about us in agriculture, that, that becomes a really important point. Um, how people understand agriculture, um, how they understand images they see in agriculture. You know, how do we understand language? How do we learn language? Um, this stuff goes back to Pierre Saucer, um, Barthes, some of the you know original rhetoric um, researchers way back when, and how we understand the world around us. And what's interesting is they say that with images, it's not necessarily inborn in us, it's what we learn. And it's not something that's taught to us. We learn what signs mean by visualizing you know, and seeing our parents stop at the stop sign every time. We learn what different things in our world are by seeing them on an everyday basis. We're not always necessarily told what things are. So a lot of this research looks at how do we understand images? And what are they portraying in terms of culture um, and, and the world around us? And one of the first theories that you'll see sometimes is aesthetics. And we've talked about aesthetics a lot um, when it comes to just basic graphic design. And aesthetics is the art, the colors, the texts, the shapes. It's the composition of the image and how it's created. And how are we maximizing communication based on this composition, okay? So when we look at aesthetics, um, in research, we look at not only the composition, but the maker and the viewer of that. And what do those aesthetics say? Um, here, looking at this poster, you know, aesthetically, we've got lines of text coming in to what we um, see as a human's face. Obviously, James Brown, based on the text, um, the color, the words, all, you know, the blues, the theme of it. Um, all can come into the aesthetics and the um, coloring of the image. This is another one in terms of the aesthetic that you look at. Um, it's a very dominant image. Um, there's something wrong with Esther. So it's the text, the coloring. You notice the, the shading on the image is a little um, blurred. So this orphan movie poster can put off perceptions and feelings based on the actual art that's used. And what takes it into a little different, um, you start thinking about people's perceptions and how we perceive images. And a lot of this is very un unconsciously. Um, and there's a lot of critics with visual communications because it is, it is for lack of a better term, fluffy. Um, when you do you ever really understand yourself? Do you ever really understand um, how you bring context to images you see? So perception becomes really important. Um, and a lot of it, like I said, is processed unconsciously. It's how our brain, brain is receiving and deriving meaning from messages and images. And a lot of times this relates to emotional learning, emotional appeal, fear appeal and advertisement. You know, we're, we're receiving a perception that they are happy based on the smiles on their face. Um, you know, somebody could say, is she trying to strangle her? Well, no, because they're smiling um, and it's squeeze, it's a natural. So they're, they're hugging um, and we get that perception based on what we know emotionally from the other things that we've seen. 
Um, how do you know a smile is really means happy? You know, this is where visual communications really comes into play. Um, the way we see um, beautiful, what is beautiful, Estee Lauder, um, puts these terms there and makes us make this juxtaposition that this is beautiful. This is what beautiful is, is, you know, a woman, a bride, um, white, innocent, you know, high cheekbones, dominant chin, beautiful eyes. Um, same thing with the Marlboro man, what makes manly. Um, we see manly as a like, rugged cowboy in the, you know, the leather and the jean and the cowboy hat on the horse and the wood. All of that gives us a perception of what rugged and manly and a smoker might be. So this is sort of how we look at images. Um, and, it, and we use it in agriculture a lot as well. Um, we have, if you take a look, this is our college website um, image a few years ago, and they're showing a youth who is got their teddy bear, her bicycle helmet, you know, what, what's the perception that we're putting out there for the parents? Because this is the parents' corner. So we're showing your, your young daughter in her little tennis shoes and jeans rolled up, sweet, innocent pose, um, in your car, leaving for college. Again, she's got her teddy bear, something safe, her helmet, she's going to be safe. Um, FFA. Um, a lot of times FFA tries to um, show, and actually a lot of association, 4-H, FFA, or college, and some of their branding and marketing, um, try and put up the perception of a diverse group. And so you'll see um, a variety of cultures. Um, I help with National FFA every year doing their um, photos at their national convention, and there's, there is a need in their visuals that they want to put off the perception of this culturally diverse. So when I'm directing the photographers to take convention photos throughout the week, it's find diversity, find a kid in a wheelchair, somebody who's blind, find somebody who's visually or um, height impaired, um, somebody of a, you know, a non-typical um, race other than the white boy um, that you would see in FFA. So they're trying to um, bring in this perception with the imagery that they show. And you can do a lot of studies looking at companies and um, visuals that they put out and what the perceptions they're trying to show. If you also notice, this is red, white, and blue, FFA, American children, okay, learning, exceeding, flag. Um, there is, there's research that looks at visual literacy, and it's sort of the skill of interpreting visual images accurately and seeing how you represent yourself through these images. Um, it, it's one of those things that we, we are educating youth to be um, critical of what they were, read, critical of what they see in terms of media, but how critical in terms of images do we see? Images um, can be so powerful in terms of you know, the, the analogies that they play. You know, this, this toothpaste here is showing us this healthy, skinny person. If I keep, you know, brushing my teeth, I'm going to be this healthy, skinny person. Um, like I said, the just position of um, if I'm wearing this white, beautiful dress, I'm going to be beautiful as well. Or if I'm rugged on a horse, I'm going to be the Marlboro Man. And then manipulating. Images can can manipulate situations to make us believe things. Um, we talked about propaganda at one point, and images were a big part of that um, when there's manipulations. This is a famous photo, um, or infamous, um, the LA Times put out. The What had happened was the shooter had taken two shots and was going to send both shots to the LA Times, but while he was playing on his computer, he just plainly had combined the shots and accidentally emailed that to the LA Times or sent that to the LA Times and so they um, that was what they published well when it came out you know this image of the soldier pointing the gun at the man and the child is much more impactful than if you see the real situation here okay he's not he's not telling this guy to stop he's not necessarily pointing it out and you know you can tell um, if you look at the people, especially, 
right here there's a woman looking towards the man and here's the woman looking away from the man. If you look here, you see the woman twice. So um, you can tell that the image had been doctored and then that's how people actually realize that this, but this is a manipulation of the image. So you know, when we are looking at images in terms of literacy, how we read, how we understand our world through images. Um, one of the top methodologies you'll see in visual studies is this idea of psychoanalysis. And psychoanalysis um, is done a lot on movies and it's looking at how, um, how, it, how the world deals with the subjectivity of sexuality and the unconsciousness of human um, interactions. And Freud is, the, is one of the top researchers that you will see in a lot of this. Um, and what's interesting with psychoanalysis is typically with qualitative research, we are being very reflexive and we um, t say what are we bring to the situation. Um, but with this, we don't because we don't necessarily, um, we can't assume that we fully understand ourselves, let alone um, fully understand the analysis that we're doing. So, so psychoanalysis has some um, good qualities, bad qualities to it, depending on how you look at it. Um, basically what it does is it uses aspects of images to interpret the effect on viewers. So what is the um, effect that you have when you view this movie or this a sitcom or this image. Um, so it's subjectivity and the unconsciousness. <clears throat> a lot of times in psychoanalysis what we'll see is um, it's really rooted in a lot of feminism and disempowerment type research. So obviously psychoanalysis isn't one we see as much in agriculture, but it is an interesting methodology and theory. Um, as I said, it's very based in Freud. Um, and so what it does is it a lot of times bases itself on this castration complex. The complex that, the idea that women um, are damaged, women are passive when it comes to the male. Uh, and, you know, it implies, you know, that women um, are, you know, that when looking at emotional effects, we must realize that not all effects work at the conscious level. So there's some subconscious stuff. And what we see a lot is this idea of active male versus passive female. We see um, the man acting on things, the woman in the background being very passive. Um, voyeurism is one way um, that we see this when you will see something in terms of you know, objectifying what is being looked at. So putting distance between the male and the female participants or between the male and the female protagonist and the audience. Okay? The camera takes this hero point of view when it's in a voyeurism. Um, you know, women are just only shown as this beautiful object. The other times we'll see um, this mirror stage and this is sort of the deep focus um, the child sees the ideal self. Um, the camera movements are determined by the male in the movie. Okay, so we're seeing through him. We ID, ID our, identify ourselves with the hero in the movie. So um, a lot of times the camera position, the point of view, does this mirror, mirror stage. We also will see um, this male gaze that we'll see. Um, and if you notice, a lot of this is male. Um, Lassian talked about this gaze and, you know, the individual's born into its visuality. So this provides possibility because both, um, you know, it, it's male. So we are only seeing through the male gaze. Um, so Malve, I apologize, not Gassian, Malve um, really says that it's all in the male gaze. Um, you know, if you think about movies you see, the televisions you watch, you know, is this truly accurate? Um, is everything in this castration complex is an active male versus passive female? The Lassian gaze, oh my god, I skipped ahead of myself here, um, is a different way of looking at it. And it's not necessarily how the subject sees, but how is it seen? 
Um, and this one really, when you do a psychoanalysis, um, if, you're, if you're not looking at this voyeurism, this last thing on gaze is looking at both men and women and how they look at different things. So um, this is where, you know, it's structured through the signs. Um, it, it fails to offer this sort of visual mastery. Okay, so it reminds us of mortality since it goes on after we're dead. So it's an interesting way to look at things. There's also this idea of the fantasy, um, not just the viewer. Um, you could be putting yourself in the fantasy. There's no necessarily dominant male or female gaze, but it's putting yourself into the fantasy. The idea of um, the love story, typically some type of narrative. Um, so it looks at the so staging of desire, imagining the, yourself in a role, okay? And this too is located in the division between your conscious and your unconscious, sort of the daydreaming. Um, but as I said, there has to be this reflectivity in this research because we may not necessarily fully understand ourselves. Um, there is the chance that an author can overemphasize. So there is some problems with psychoanalysis. You know, it, it does neglect a lot of times race and class, um, and it has this overemphasization on sexuality. So we see this a lot in um, women's studies. And it also tends to emphasize the psychic more than the cultural. It doesn't bring in our cultural balance. Um, so you know, psychoanalysis is used, not maybe not as much in agriculture, but I have seen um, a few studies looking at this. Um, and it does come into play in some different studies that you, you'll see. Um, example, that you know, this is awkward to us to see um, because we're put into the situation of viewing um, these men in this, you know, situation, this cuddly situation. It's not the normal um, with what we see, so it's sort of an uncomfortable um, voyeurism, where if we look at these same exact images with women, you're you're seeing them as this passive. Um, it's okay for them to be um, have stuff on their face and perfecting themselves, making themselves more beautiful. Um, we see it a lot in um, natural art. Um, for example, down here, the the man in the image is active and moving. The woman is sort of riled up and um, bound up and eyes closed, very sensitive, very passive. Um, we see with a lot of the, the images of um, paintings done in the early 17th century of um, women very passive and innocent. Um, but again, always taking that male, male perspective. The other research um, sort of realm and theory that you'll see with visual studies, semiotics. Now this is one that is used a lot um, in ag communications. Um, I've done several semiotic studies myself. Um, I had grad students and again, um, down Texas A&M, they've done some stuff too. And semiotics sort of um, looks at things in a different way. It basically says there's an ideology. And this ideology is the representative power in that culture. So where psychoanalysis didn't take into account culture, Semiotics does take into account your culture. So Saucer is sort of one of the, the fathers of semiology, and he said there were sort of three things that have, that we used to make relationships in linguistics. There was the sign, the signified, and the signifier. So for example, rose. If I, a rose is the sign. So the signifier would be if I said rose to you, and signified would be what you saw. It's sort of that referent, that historical motivation. Um, and a lot of times the relationship is very arbitrary and non-motivated. So if I said um, vacation to you, you might that may signify um, a tropical beach, that may signify a mountain. If I say dog, it may be your little foo-foo puppy that sits on your lap all the day, or it could be a Rottweiler attacking you. Depending on our referent, our background, our schema maybe, um, is how we make these relationships with linguists, linguists, 
linguistics and imagery. So the value of the term um, is dependent on what within the text and the culture that it is. And the relationship um, which precede and follow it between these terms becomes important with semiotics. <clears throat> and so it says that the meaning of the visual is anchored by the occupying text. Okay, so um, if we had vacation next to an imagery of um, a broken down car, that's telling us that maybe vacation isn't a good thing, or we you know, typically might think. So the text just um, ambiguates the image a little bit and anchors it rather than it just being out there. Um, Barthes took it a little farther and said there's sort of two levels to it. There's the denotative level or the, and the connotative level. So denotative is that first level. Um, <clears throat> so at what, you know, basic what we see, so the rows, um, the word is signified, uh, or is the signifier, um, could be signifying, you know, passion. Um, so at the top level, it's a flower. At the connotation, it's the cultural knowledge, the culture behind it. So it's sort of that signified passion. So a rose at the connotative level would be the passion. So if you think about it, you, um, ideology you know, how does this play into the analysis of the connotation? Obviously, the culture around you, um, if this was a black rose, maybe in America we would not see that as passion. Um, we would connotate it as something else um, negative, where other cultures may not. So your ideology is going to um, really come into play, according to Barthes, when we look at this denotative and connotative level. And like I said, this has been used a lot in agriculture, looking at imagery and ads and what, what you know, subconscious meanings they're putting behind things. So semiotic analysis, um, it's sort of knowing the cultural difference and the social relationship between things. And so when we do an analysis, we look at everything from age, gender, race, how the hair is styled, how the body is styled, um, size, looks, touch, movement, poses, contact, expression, everything, every setting, every color, everything can come into play when we look at semiotics. And it's one reason I really enjoy looking at it in terms of um, agricultural research. So uh, Pierce also talked about um, the sign and he sort of gave it three different ways. He said there's sort of the icon. Um, which is the signifier has a likeness to the sign. Um, so a picture of a baby, for example. Um, an index is the internal relationship between the signifier and the signifier. Um, male figure on the door, male restroom. Okay. So an iconic thing is just the picture. The index is sort of that relationship. And then there's the symbol, the arbitrary relationship. So that baby might equal future. So when we look at um, this, we look at the codes, the, the symbols and the signs that are out there, and we look at the reference system around what that image we're studying is, and then we also look at the juxtapositions of things. Um, you know, if it's uh, a cow laying on a, a beach, what are they trying to say? Okay, so. So we look at all of these different things with the signs. So, um, for example, you know, this porcelain egg might mean old or odd to you, but with the word wealthy, it's putting this into a specific um, index that we want it to be. So at this point, it's giving it that relationship, um, you know, wise. They're, they're trying to say that a club, a Canadian, it's wise. So they're, they're just deciding, say, that to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, you need to drink this drink. Okay. Um, these are examples. Um, these are two images, you know, advertisements that sort of came around um, in terms of patriotism right around the Iraqi war. Um, they were trying to show patriotism. Um, the woman was moved in, showing America, um, you know, why she's wearing all white, innocent. The only real color is the flag. Um, trying to pull that, and so we look at we look at her face. We look at how we're looking at her, 
and then it puts into account the fashion for America. So, um, you know, they, they talk about how um, this didn't really necessarily promote individuality. It promoted um, the goal of unity and sameness um, with the war. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a product. It can be the, the view. Um, they're saying in here, just supposing, you know, if you are in the Army Reserve, you're going to have personal courage and integrity, honor, selfless service, respect, duty, loyalty. Look at the font. It's a rough, tumble font, um, strong font. Um, you see the boots going up, showing you will move up in your world. The coloring of the black and the yellow, very dominant um, colors. The, you know, the white, all capital, you know, again, that dominance. So we're seeing these signs um, that are signifying this ideal of what would happen if you are in the Army Reserve. The other thing um, a lot of semiotics will talk about, too, is with the cover of magazines. Um, the type of magazine cover that they put will sort of be the... Um, referent you use for looking through the rest of the magazine. So on this one, we've got um, Be a Better Man, you know, an Esquire. We've got the tough, dominant man, the, the black leather jacket, the white t-shirt, you know, the sort of 50s rough and tumble look. And so as we go through this magazine, that's sort of our referent um, of what kind of, when they talk about man, what they're talking about. Now at this point, some of you probably are thinking she's nuts. Um, how are you seeing this? And there's a lot of people who say that, you know, are we reading too much into it? But there's a lot of research um, that Barthes and Saucer and some of them have done back in linguistics that show this subconscious um, understanding of things. So semiotic, like I said, there, there are a lot of critics um, that say, you know, you can't be generalized. Can we, can we truly generalize? Because can you read these ads out of the cultural setting and out of the um, world around it, if we really want to understand that connotation level, um, we can sort of figure that denotation, but can we figure out that connotation level if we're out of that specific cultural setting? And so this is a qualitative, and um, the semiological studies that we do, a lot of times we have to be very reflexive and say where we're coming from, our cultural ideology, um, yeah, I did one, I did a semiotic study looking at advertisements with the tractor supply company and I had to um, talk about the magazines that those ads were published in and, and my role in the demographic of those publications. And so how was I involved in that culture and that um, sort of ideology around those ads? So when we look at semiotics, it can be a really neat way um, to understand how people see things subconsciously. Um, I've done semiotic studies where we've given youth cameras and told them to go to take pictures of agriculture. And we brought these back in and we looked at the images and what were sort of the, what was that con denotative level of those images and what was the connotative level? What was the underlying meaning that they were showing us with those images? So there's some fun, fun research you can do with semiotic analysis. Um, example here, you know, Top Gun. We all love Top Gun. If you start looking at the visual um, messages behind Top Gun, you you can see women are seen as a success to be a Top Gun. So if the woman who was in there, she had to be very successful so um, to be that Top Gun pilot. Um, so, you know, some of the research would say that it makes women want to be with men in uniform if they see these kinds of things because men in uniform are strong and are exciting um, so they want to be with a military man so that also elevates them to be this top gun um, the also thing you'll see is males you know if it's saying if you join the military you wear a uniform you exhibit marks of rank and honor you're going to score with women um, and we see that, this relationship between Charlie and Maverick. Um, you know, as he gets stronger and more dominant in his military area, how much more stronger and dominant and more fun the relationship between them is. What's interesting, um, you know, celebrities, this individualistic heroes and military valor, and sort of military values, are some of the things that some researchers have said. Um, the struggle between good and evil. 
winning the war, winning the woman, winning sport, winning the success, being this top gun. Um, so a lot of military films, um, there's been a lot of research looking at those. In fact, in Top Gun, um, so a research study looking at this um, made the point that there was a, a silent black part pilot in the movie that you never saw his name and you only saw him in, in back things. And so he was not ever seen prominently, but the one chance when you see a glimpse of his helmet, it said sundown. So um, sundown may connotate the lack of light. So what are they saying um, culturally as well in this movie? So, you know, it's, do you agree? Um, are, are people reading too much into it or are they not? You know, take back and take a step back and think about what, what images you learn through images. How have you um, learned through these things? So is this aesthetic war and this um, soft war propaganda for the military? Does it make being in the military look exciting and fun? Um, take a couple look at um, some images. Let's look at the denotative and the connotative level. Denotative, you know, obviously the man's in um, a wheelchair and he's in a suit. The Mac is comfortable, um, younger. So connotatively, what is this saying to us? If I'm a PC, I'm broken, I'm old, I'm stuffy. If I'm a Mac, I'm young, I'm vibrant, I'm fun, casual. Um, so, and we get that, you know, there's the sign of his untucked t-shirt and what does that signify? It signifies you know, sort of that casual look. Um, same thing, a lot of research done, again, with, you know, almost going back to that psychoanalysis and socio and, and semiology. The chef does everything but cook, but that's what wives are for. So we've got the loving wife on her husband. She's got her chef hat. She's helping make, um, she's cooking everything, okay? Um, so I'm giving my wife a Kenwood chef. Um, another example, um, when we look at semiology, you know, you look at this, what are they trying to portray? What is, you know, what is that connotative level of this? Notice the, the rustic um, leathers, the glass, it's all brown tinting, white tinting. The dog in the background is not just a regular dog, it's you know, a bulldog, which you know, has that signifying the manliness. And um, you notice the man is posed, he's very open, very active in the situation. His pants are on buttons, so they're trying to you know, take it down to a cognitive level of sexuality. Um, almost a voyeurism onto him. The same thing, but if you look at a woman, similar things, her blouse is very low cut. Um, she's wearing all dimmin, denim, so it's sort of natural. Um, her hair is long, brushed to the side, sort of the sultry look. Um, but notice her body positioning is very um, closed in. She's hunched over, um, her legs are somewhat closed, so she's very passive. And we don't see much of the background, okay? Because it's, you know, it's all her. Um, so when you think about agriculture, do we, you know, what signs do we put out in ag media? You know, are we, are we influencing the stereotypes? Are we changing stereotypes? You know, we think about images of animals in terms of animal care and animal welfare. What are we showing? What are those signs and those levels? Um, there's some fun ads to think about, you know. Um, we're out here for a reason. So are we. You know, the stuff you need out here. So tractor supply, you know, the rough and targeted truck, um, we're here to help you just as your dog is. He's rounded up the cattle, the sheep, and the grandchildren. He's never met a leftover he wouldn't eat, and he's shown again and again why he's your best friend. So just stick the sozing tractor supply as well. We'll be there for you again and again, and be your best friend. Um, you know, nothing improves your balance like easier bookkeeping from farm plan. Now take a look at this, you know, we've got the red and the white and the blue, very Americana. Cattle in field, grazing, green grass, sunny trees, um, very iconic agriculture. He's got a leather belt, a little knife there, um, but he's doing, he's got the work gloves on, but he's doing something very unique. Um, so he's got his, um, skateboard there and he's trying to do something different, trying to balance. And so they're, they're playing on very different um, levels there. And lastly, you know, love me, don't eat me. 
you know, the pig in the perfect green grass, um, go vegetarian, pigs are friendly, intelligent, who form strong bonds. They don't want to be your breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Okay, so when we take this into the connotation, um, if we didn't have these words and we didn't look at the ideology around it, we could just say it's a cute pig, um, happy, he's got a kiss on him. But when we take it into the consideration of the text around us, it brings it into a different connotative level. So psycho psychoanalysis, so semiology, um, looking at rhetoric in terms of images is sort of a unique way to look at communications and how we're communicating um, at the, the surface level and the um, subsurface level. So I hope you enjoyed thinking about these things in just a little different way. Um, you'll never look at an ad the same again, trust me. I'll talk to you guys later.